So uh, let's move on to our last speaker, uh, who is also providing his contribution uh, from across the pond. Uh, so let's welcome Professor Supriya Ruth from the University of Victoria, Canada. And he's going to talk about the legal imagination of a social relationship idea of work. Professor Ruth, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pietro. Uh, am I audible? Just a small yes, nod. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Pietro, could you please remind me at 13 minutes that I have two more minutes to go? Yes, and I'm hoping yes. to share my PowerPoint. I'm not sure if that's accessible to you all or not. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm going to talk about... Um, I'm not going to say again uh, that I'm going to offer something new. This has been discussed and particularly uh, John Budd mentioned this as well as uh, Manfred Weiss. Uh, I'm talking about social relational idea of work and what I'm going to offer is uh, I'm going to offer a, a, an evidence to corroborate the social relational idea of work. Well, before we go on with the PowerPoint slides, I first wanted to thank the organizers. And uh, after hearing from Manfred West, how beautiful Belgamo, Bergamo is, I am, I am jealous not being there. And uh, buongiorno a tutti. That's the only Italian I know. Um, and good morning from where I am sitting today. So my thesis for today's uh, talk is the following, is that although there is a political acknowledgement of work as social relational, the legal conceptualization of work is stuck in the past. So that's my general thesis. And I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to offer uh, as my evidence, the essential services that's been categorized both under the labor relations regime, as well as the emergency services regime. And I'm going to draw on evidence from Canada, more particularly British Columbia, because in Canada, uh, labor relations is provincial. So therefore every provinces would have their own labor relations law. So just to give you a little context, the uh, British Columbia Labor Relations Code uh, of 1996 uh, seeks to balance essential services with job action, that is right to strike and right to uh, uh, lockout. So the sense uh, of this law is to strike a balance between these two. And then the Supreme Court of Canada in uh, 2015 said, essential services are those services whose interruption would end endanger the life, personal safety or health of the whole or part of the population. Mere inconvenience does not make something an essential service. So once essential service is declared, what happens is that, uh, oh, pardon me. Thank you. So, uh, um, the Labor Relations Board investigates the threat to health, safety, or welfare and designates certain services as essential. What happens uh, in this declaration is the Labor Relations Regime moves from the private contractual basis to the public relational aspect of Labor Relations. Um, and why I'm saying that is for the following reason. It has to be suggested by the minister. So the Labor Relations Board will consult with the minister of uh, the government and then only declare that uh, there is an essential service. And that essential service cannot be interrupted because work must go on uh, irrespective of whatever happens in the labor relations regime, in the private contractual regime, that is, irrespective of whatever is happening between the trade union and the management, the work will have to be performed. That's what the labor relations regime says. And um, then there is another regime, if we could move on to the next slide, uh, which is the uh, Declaration of Essential Service under the BC Emergency Program Act of 1996. And this declaration was made during COVID, uh, because COVID, as we all know, uh, is an emergency, has been categorized as an emergency. 
Now, why I'm drawing my evidence from uh, this BC Emergency Programs Act, uh, Programs Act rather than the Labor Relations Code is for the following reason. Well, the Labor Relations Code works on a particular logic. It works on a contractual logic between uh, in the trade union and management. Whereas the BC Emergency Programs Act, since it's not essentially a labor relations statute, I expect the law to tell me what really work is without having to put work in a particular legal framework. Thus, I think it's valuable that we draw lessons from uh, other uh, legislation that sees work in a particular way. So let's see what the BC, under the BC Emergency Programs Act, what has happened uh, in here. Under that law, essential services are those daily services that are essential to preserving life, health, public safety, and basic societal functioning. And emergency means when there is an imminent danger, imminent event happening, or the circumstances mandate that uh, everyone needs to coordinate their work. And this emergency could arise from forces of nature. And then again, under this law as well, wide range of powers are given to the minister uh, of the government during an emergency. Could we move on to the next slide, please? Now, um, the list of essential services as to after COVID had happened, what ought to be declared as essential must be decided by the minister of the government. And then it would have to be discussed with a uh, provincial health officer. And then uh, all these services must remain open. And what I'm going to show in the next few, few slides, those slides are not for readability purpose. I don't expect anyone to read these slides. I intend these slides only to have an effect on you. You don't have to read this because uh, what I intend to show you, the range of services that has been declared essential. Now, health and health services, as Manfred West uh, earlier mentioned, health services, uh, the folks uh, uh, during, particularly during an emergency, folks uh, tend to self-exploit themselves in uh, health services. So health, health and health services were included. Uh, the next slide, please. So was law enforcement, public safety, first responders, and emergency response personnel. These are all different categories of workers who are included under the general category of law enforcement. The next one, please. And then you have the vulnerable population service providers. These uh, workers provide services to the vulnerable population, however they are categorized. Next one. And then you have workers offering critical infrastructure. Next. Food and agricultural service providers. Next. Retail sector, next. Transportation, next. Industry and manufacturing, next. Sanitation, next. Communications and information technology, next. Financial institutions, next. Other non-health essential service providers. And again, I told you, you don't have to read the slide, but I can tell you this much. I appear in this slide. Uh, educational services, including services by university professors, are categorized as non-health essential service providers. So in this sense, I am an essential worker under these declarations. Could we move on to the next slide, please? Now, could you think of any service, could you think of any worker that has been excluded from those categories, from that declaration of essential as to the services that must remain open so that the society could function properly? Well, I could not. I could probably identify one or two tourism related work that are not related otherwise to health or some other transportation or some other category of work. But except for certain rare categories of work, I thought every work was included in the declaration of essential services. And this is decided by the minister, by the public, therefore, by the government. Now, these essential services, this comprehensive list of essential services are essential to the preservation of life, health, public safety, and basic societal functioning. 
And why is the rationale for public intervention in these services? These services are all performed as part of contractual understanding between workers and employers. Or in collective labor context, in a trade union and uh, the management. If private contractual basis is the rationale for all this work to be performed legally, conceptualized legally as private contracts, what is then the rationale for public intervention? The rationale is the imminence of an event or circumstance, that is emergency, because it requires prompt coordination of action or special regulation. Now, the urgency is something, could we move on to the next slide? Please? So urgency is something that triggers public intervention and otherwise a private contractual relationship. However, if for a moment we forget that urgency triggers public intervention and thereby moving what is otherwise legitimate uh, uh, what otherwise legitimately belongs to the private contractual exchange to a public relational aspect, if we move urgency from it, the entire reasoning is based on the idea of social crisis. Because if these work are not being done, it will result in a social crisis. In view of this formulation, therefore, the primary function of the list of services enumerated under Emergency Act is their social contribution. At its core, work performed to offer these services are therefore social relational. The market relational nature of work as contractual exchange, and I'm talking about an employment contract here, but that employment contract is seen as an individual employment contract or a collective employment contract between the trade union and a management. It's a mere technical imagination of work that has become part of the labor relations regime. Now, labor relations regime cannot move without that technical framework because it has become so integrated in our legal imagination. But if you look at other legislation, it sort of gives us what work really is and how we should evaluate and understand work. If we could move on to the next slide. Thus, I'm going to suggest the following chain of inductive uh, reasoning. If the emphasis of essential is core need of the society or the public, then essential means socially necessary work. Now from the list above that I have taken through to, uh, to all those slides, you could see that most work, I would even argue if I wanted to be uh, really provocative that all work equals to essential. They're all essential work and thus they're all socially necessary. Next one, please. If essential therefore means socially necessary work that includes, I'm drawing on the list, all work or most work, and if essential results in social regulation or public intervention in working relationships, shouldn't, by deduction, all work or most work be regulated socially. That is, all work or most work is socially relational. That therefore, regulation of work, all work or most work, on the list, you will draw your own conclusions. I'm suggesting regulation of work must be akin to something that's called public law. It doesn't have to be a replication of administrative law or constitutional law. But regulation of work ought to be conceived as a part of public law, not equaling to private law of contract, even if modified contract. And we all understand that even when employment relationships are based on contractual relationships, there is public intervention in bits and pieces in employment law. But what I'm suggesting is that the public intervention be central to the idea of regulation of work. Thus, labor law ought to be the law of social contract with a limited role for private contractual relationship. Can we have the last slide, please? Oh, no, I have one more. And um, so I wanted to mention, in spite of this recognition that essential work is almost every work and therefore they're socially necessary, 
from 2001 in beyond employment supio had and and supio's colleague had noted that what the courts are trying to do is being innovative in interpretation and in and around 2021 we see the same exact same thing with respect to the uber jurisprudence in europe in north america and elsewhere in the globe that the idea of the court is merely to interpret and bring uber drivers as employees so everyone is engaged in interpretive activity rather than conceptualizing thus i am suggesting in the next slide that uh, uh, drawing on the following uh, authors, uh, drawing, drawing on Hannah Arendt, work is human interaction with nature or social ecology. Then I'm looking at Karl Polanyi. If work is fundamental human condition, according to Arendt, then market exchange of labor, that is employment contract, only offers a narrow frame of reference to visualize human interaction. And then I'm drawing also on Supio saying that membership of the labor force ought to be the structure by means of which we look at legal relational aspects of work social relational aspects of work and i'm suggesting that if membership of the labor force should be the lens by which we legally see work it could only be visualized in its relationship to the society because when you have a broad category such as membership of the labor force, it could only pertain to the society. Labor law, therefore, or more broadly, and more attractive to this idea of regulation of work, then could be the law channeling social responsibility towards workers. I will conclude with those points and then look forward to the discussion uh, that might ensue. Thank you all very much.